Each and every day, new entrepreneurs around the world are starting their own enterprises, most of whom are armed with an idea for an amazing service or product, so they think, but not armed with the tools they need to build an enduring business. That's where author Eric Ries comes in. He's seen numerous businesses start and fail, most notably his own. However, he has also learned the lessons from these false starts and has gone on to create great success building a multi-million dollar enterprise and coaching others to do the same. What awaits you in the next 12 minutes is literally the keys to a system that, almost without fail, will lead you to a successful business. So if you're willing to put what you think you know aside, you're about to learn the way almost every new business in the world will be run in less than 10 years. What does it mean to run a lean startup? According to Reese, there are five principles that are critical to the success of a startup and what makes a startup a lean one. First is the idea that entrepreneurs are everywhere. They're the person who just lost their job in the recession and have struck out on their own. They're the person who has started and sold his first five businesses and is on to his sixth. There are people we traditionally read about in magazines and books, the self-made success stories. However, entrepreneurs are also found in global corporations working on the next big idea. The second idea is that entrepreneurship is management. The goal of an entrepreneur is to build a sustainable enterprise, and so there needs to be a new and predictable method of doing so, especially in the middle of the digital revolution we find ourselves in. The third idea is that startups exist not to make money or even to serve customers, but to learn how to build a sustainable business. This is the idea that is the most critical to Reese's entire premise, and it's a revolutionary one. Most entrepreneurs start a business with a new idea thinking, most of the time incorrectly, that they have an idea that will be a huge success. Why else start a business and take all that risk? Then they plod along, hustling the hell out of that idea until they either fail or succeed, usually in a spectacular fashion. However, Reese argues, if the organization can learn as quickly as possible what the marketplace values enough to pay for, they will be able to adapt their business and grow it into a sustainable enterprise. He calls this validated learning. Fourth is the method in which companies should approach this task. Build, measure, and learn. The idea is to get back to the build as quickly as possible after learning from the marketplace. The quicker you can get through this cycle, the faster you'll learn what the market values and the better chance you'll have of surviving and building a sustainable business. Lastly is the idea of innovation accounting. Although it sounds sexy, this is actually the boring stuff that will make a company successful. It's the measurements you take, the milestones you set, and how you prioritize the work you get done. What these five principles add up to is a new way of thinking about management. Because if you value innovation as a company, whether you're a startup or a multi-billion dollar behemoth, this is the way you'll accomplish it. Build a product. The first thing you need to do is to build a quality product or service for the marketplace. And if you don't know who the customer is, you don't know what quality is. So the first step is to create something called a customer archetype. The purpose of the archetype is to humanize the target market for your business. It will guide all of the decisions you make about product development and allocation of resources moving forward. So, before you make anything, make sure you know exactly who you're making it for. Second, you're going to need to take a leap of faith at some point. No matter how much research you've done and how certain you are of your chances of success, your new venture is going to have to make some assumptions on some very important things. The key is to know just what part of your plan is a leap of faith. A simple tool for this would be the analog antilog. There's no problem basing your strategy for a new business based on the success of some other company or industry, as long as you also know what you don't know. For instance, when they were building the iPod, Apple knew that people would listen to music in public places wearing earphones based on the success of the Sony Walkman. This answered a critical question for Apple. However, what they didn't know was whether or not people would pay for music. The antelog to this was that Napster had just proven that people, in record numbers, would stop paying for music when offered a free, albeit illegal, alternative. So they built their now insanely successful business on a leap of faith, but they knew exactly where the risk lied. The next step in this process is to build a rapid prototype. Most people have heard of Zappos by now, the billion dollar a year online shopping portal. 
It had started out as a rapid prototype by founder Nick Swimmer. In fact, his original idea was to build a brand new retail experience, which he could have pursued at great cost and risk. Instead, he chose to run an experiment. He wanted to see if people would buy shoes online. So, he went around to shoe stores in his area and asked if he could take pictures of the shoes the stores had in stock. He would take those pictures and put them up on a website, and if people bought the shoes from him, he would return to the store and buy them at full price. There, for next to nothing except his time and energy, Nick had figured out that people would indeed buy shoes online. There are a few important lessons to glean here. The first is to always build what the startup community now calls a minimum viable product. It's the smallest product or service that you can create and start generating learning from. Nick didn't need anything more than a simple website to start Zappos, and it's likely that you need a heck of a lot less than you think you do to launch a new product. Second, you should be attempting to attract the early adopter market with this minimum viable product. Because these early adopters know that they'll almost always get a product with bugs in it, you don't need to worry about having the best possible product to launch. In fact, any effort beyond what you need for a minimum viable product is considered waste because it wasn't driven in response to the marketplace. Measure and learn. The startup's job is to figure out where they are right now, confront the cold hard facts, and then design experiments to move the numbers closer to what they laid out in the business plan. These come together in what Reese calls the three learning milestones. One, establish the baseline. Two, tuning the engine and three, pivot or persevere. In establishing the baseline, you need to make sure that you're setting the right metrics. One thing to be wary of are vanity metrics. In the web startup world, these metrics might include website visitors, and in some cases, even registered users. In almost every case, these metrics will lead you to focus on actions that, at best, limit your chances for success. In order to prevent this, you should be sure that your metrics meet the three A's test, where your metrics are actionable, accessible, and auditable. In order for it to be actionable, it must demonstrate a clear cause and effect relationship so that you can take definitive action in response to it. In order for it to be accessible, it must be easily understood and available widely to people in the company. Lastly, in order to be auditable, you need to be able to go back to the source of data to prove that the metrics were telling the true and entire story. One example of these kind of metrics would be the ones used by Imvu, Reese's company, in their startup phase. The company sold a 3D avatar slash social networking service that I would describe as a chat service where you can dress up your character. Using $5 a day in pay-per-click advertising, they were able to get 100 visits to their website to test their product. They considered each day's visitors to be one cohort and tested each cohort on the following data points. How many people signed up? How many people then went on to actually log into their account? How many people had one chat? How many people had five chats? And how many people became paying customers? Now a good way for you to do this for your own business is to pick metrics in the following buckets. Registration, activation, retention, and referral. Grokit, an online learning company, used this model in one month sprints using split tests, which are sometimes referred to as A-B tests, to determine the effectiveness of the changes they were making to the product. Quite often, products get improved when the CEO says that he heard from somebody that they didn't like feature X, or a product engineer says that they can improve the product by doing Y. Most often, these changes have no effect on customer behavior at all, and most times that critical fact goes unnoticed. This is a crucial point to understand. When making improvements to your product, the only arbiter of whether or not it was successful is the metrics. And when you're implementing an improvement to your product, you should be testing that improvement against a baseline to see what, if any, impact the change has on your business results. This is the only way a company should be implementing a product development strategy. Unless, of course, you somehow have millions of dollars somewhere that don't need to be accounted for to anybody and that you don't need to provide a positive return on. Pivot or persevere. At some point, you'll need to make the decision about whether or not your business strategy has a reasonable chance of success. This is the time where you'll need to decide to either pivot or persevere. Of course, if things are working well and you can see the path to great success and profits, keep working on the idea that you've started with. Just make sure that your decision is based on the cold hard facts. A pivot is a fundamental change in your business strategy. If you conclude that your business strategy isn't likely to succeed, you can change your strategy. 
This is where the mindset of an entrepreneur comes in. A true entrepreneur is learning how to build a sustainable enterprise, not make a single product idea a success. There are many kinds of pivots you can make. A zoom in pivot, where a single feature of your product becomes the entire product. A zoom out pivot, where your product is too narrow to support a business and you decide to make a broader product. A customer segment pivot, where you realize that you're building a product that solves a need for a segment of customers that is different than the one you started with. A customer need pivot, Based on an intimate understanding of the customers developed during your iteration process, you realize that the need you are solving for isn't very important at all, but you find new needs that you can solve instead. A business architecture pivot. This is where you go from a high-margin, low-volume solution to a low-margin, high-volume solution. A technology pivot, where you realize that you could solve the exact same problem using a completely different, and usually less expensive, technology. There are other pivots you could make, and we'd encourage you to buy the book to find out what they are. But most importantly, realize that whatever pivot you make, it's only the next hypothesis in your business model and that it should be rigorously tested just like everything else. One company that took this idea and ran with it built a technology called Aardvark, an alternative to other search engines where the answer needs to come from some form of human interaction. For instance, a question like where's the best place to get a drink after the movies tonight is not something that Google will give you a great answer for. However, Aardvark will. But this wasn't the first product launched by Max Ventilla and Damon Horowitz. In fact, it was the sixth product that they launched. In fact, it was the sixth product in less than six months. Because they'd used the lean startup model of the minimum viable product, along with rapid prototyping and measuring the results, they found out very quickly that the first five products were destined to become flops. Aardvark was the first and only product that pointed to success, and not surprisingly, it's the product that they're now growing using the same principles we've discussed so far growth. Now that you've found the product that you know will help you create a sustainable business, you need to have sustainable growth. And the only way you can have sustainable growth is when your new customers come from your old customers. There are three ways to do this. First, you can create a sticky growth engine. This depends on having a product or service that customers will continue to pay for over time. In this model, if you can bring in new customers at a faster rate than your old customers leave the service, your business will grow. The metric that you'll want to pay the most attention to is your retention rate. Second, you could create a viral engine of growth. In this model, you depend on your current customers to bring in your new customers. The most famous example of this is Hotmail, which was once a slow growth business struggling to get traction. That was until they decided to append each mail message you sent with an invitation for other people to sign up for the service, with a link directly to the sign up page. The metric for this engine is something called the viral loop. If you can get each new customer to bring in one or more customers, the viral growth will continue. The last engine for growth is the paid model. In this model, you take the profits you've earned from your old customers and invest them into advertising or any other new development tactic to attract new customers. The metrics to pay attention to in this case are the lifetime customer value, which are the profits you'll make off each customer over the lifetime of doing business with you, and the customer acquisition cost. As long as your lifetime customer value exceeds your new customer acquisition costs, you will grow. Reese makes the point that most companies only have the bandwidth to specialize in one of these engines of growth, and the time it takes to test and fine tune everything in any particular engine is too great to split your focus. So make sure you pick the engine that is best for your business. Of course, if you start on one of the engines and you find that it isn't going to work out as you hoped, you can always do a growth engine pivot and focus on a different one moving forward. In conclusion, so there you have it, everything you need to know in order to begin your lean startup journey. If you're truly an entrepreneur, you'll take Reese's advice and get passionate about building a sustainable enterprise rather than seeing your new idea succeed at all costs. Good luck, and I hope to see your next idea and become one of your customers.